Ridgecrest, I'm Britton Jones, and I have three minutes to let you know what is happening here and how you can get connected. This is RBC3. Be sure and head out to the Welcome Center this morning to see how you can get involved with We Are Family Month here at Ridgecrest in May. We have so many things planned, including a parents' night out and a young adults' night out. We also have several family-oriented workshops scheduled, so stop by the Welcome Center table and sign up for these opportunities. Pastor Ray will preach a sermon series on the family, and we will finish up the month with one worship service at 1015 on May 28th, the Sunday before Memorial Day. Parents, you will want to register your young girls for the Ridgecrest Cheer Camp set for June 21st through 23rd from 9.30 a.m. until noon at the RFC. Girls entering K-5 through 5th grade are eligible and the cost is $45. This year, our camp will be built around Colossians 3.23. By the end of the camp, our girls will know that whatever we do, including cheerleading, is to be done unto the Lord. Registration is open now at rbcdothan.org. Just click on My Ridgecrest and find our camp info. Contact Recreation Minister Lance Griffin for more information. Finally, Ridgecrest, we want to provide you with opportunities to use your creative gifts for the glory of God. On Thursday, May 4th, our Creatives Ministry will host a paint and praise event in the RFC Craft Room from 6 until 8.30 p.m. You'll be doing an acrylic painting of an inspirational beach scene on a 12 by 12 canvas. Cost is $12 and all supplies are provided. See Kelly Groves or text her at 205-522-1552 or find RBC Creatives Ministry on Facebook. So Ridgecrest, head to the Welcome Center and sign up for the We Are Family special events and seminars. Sign up now for the Ridgecrest Cheer Camp set for June 21st through June 23rd. And let Kelly Groves know you're coming to Paint and Praise Thursday, May 4th. Now, you're all caught up. I'm Britton Jones and you've been watching RBC3. Well, good morning, Ridgecrest. Isn't it a beautiful day out? Aren't you glad you're here? I'm glad to start the service as we frequently do with Believer's Baptism, and we have one this morning. His name's Anthony Duncan. Come this way, if you will, Anthony. I want to tell you a little bit about Anthony. <clears throat> Anthony began to visit with us about two months ago, and uh, when he first came here on that first Sunday, when he first came here a couple of months ago, I asked him on that first Sunday, I said, Anthony, do you know the Lord is your Savior? And he said, I'm not there yet. But he's been faithfully attending. And two weeks ago on a Sunday morning, after I'd been with our deacons in prayer, I'm walking back to my office, and I hear uh, in the distance, Pastor. I thought, well, I, 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 that's not what I heard. And I kept going. I said, Pastor. And I turned around. It was Anthony. And he comes uh, walking toward me in the mission hall there, and he said, I'm ready. And I said, you're ready? And he said, yeah, I'm ready. And then it dawned on me. I said, you're ready to trust Christ as your Savior? He said, I am. And right there in Mission Hallway, he prayed. I prayed with him to trust Christ as his Savior. And uh, today, he's following uh, that decision with Believer's Baptism. And uh, I'm so proud of him. He's a new brother uh, in Christ. And I'm so glad to be able to do this. This is really our confession of faith when we are baptized. So, Anthony, what is your confession? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Because you've made that confession, it gives me joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you one more thing real quickly. Anthony said to me, can y'all hear me? Let me tell you something. Anthony said to me before we came down, he said, Pastor, if I don't get this right, you and I both are going to take a swim.
Well, good morning again, Ridgecrest. Isn't it great to worship together? Amen. Amen. What a glorious day the Lord has made, and we're so glad you're here. And if you're a guest of ours, we're especially happy that you're here with us. If perhaps you're the first time you're visiting with us, or maybe this is the first time in a long time, would you do us a favor and inter introduce yourself or reintroduce yourself to us? By several ways you can do that. Uh, you have a connection card in your worship folder. You can just attach that. Fill that information out and get to us. You have a connection card right in front of you, on the seat in front of you. You can scan that with your phone. It'll take you to a website. If you're watching online, you'll see a QR code on your screen. You can scan that. We just want to connect with you. And that's what we do. It didn't work. At, we didn't plan this way, but RBC, reach, build, and connect. And you saw witness of that this morning. To reach those that do not know the Lord and to introduce to Him to His saving grace, to build the believer and to connect those to the mission that God has for us. Amen? So many times we can get connected to this today even. We have a family picnic at 2.30 to 4.30 at Landmark Park. There'll be no man church this evening. We'll have great games and fellowship and some snacks and just a time that we can enjoy each other's fellowship and enjoy God's goodness at Landmark Park. So if, uh, if you don't have plans, I'll tell you what, if you do have plans, cancel them, okay? And if you don't have plans, certainly you can make a plan to be with us from 2.30 to 4.30. We're just so thankful you're here with us. Let's continue to worship now, shall we, as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, Holy Spirit, our Encourager, God, thank you for gathering us this morning with purpose. And I pray, God, now that in Jesus' name, that the enemy of our soul is bound. God, that you would eliminate distractions within us so, Father, we can, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, worship you. We testify and profess that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. The name above every name, that of Jesus Christ Christ our Lord, Savior, Redeemer, Master. We pray these things in that holy name, the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Will you please stand with me this morning? We're going to read a scripture together before we sing. It's First Chronicles 29, 11. Let's say this together. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Amen.
according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mission of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell, nor any who can stand before the power. just we stand in your presence just in awe of how you move in awe of how you plucked us out of our sin and out of our disobedience to you and through the sacrifice of your son and the resurrection power from the grave you made us alive with him we are saved. We are forgiven. We are secure. All because of your love for us. God, you are great. And we love you. So Lord, we feel your presence in this place. As Pastor Ray comes, I pray, Lord, that you would surround him with the incredible power of your Holy Spirit giving unction to speak boldly what you've laid on his heart for us and God as he speaks may we be ready to not just listen but to choose to be transformed 
by the renewing of our minds to come in line with your word and to be your people because you are worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone say amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, choir and orchestra, for preparing our hearts for the Word of God. Uh, what a great job this morning in music. Let's give them a hand again. Would you do that? Take your Bibles and open up, if you will, to Exodus chapter 14, and we'll read our text in just a bit. I have to tell you, the message that I'm sharing with you, the Lord changed in the middle of the week. And on Monday, I began working on uh, Sunday's message, and uh, uh, I'll preach that to you sometime in the future, but uh, uh, on Wednesday morning, after spending some time with the Lord in prayer, um, he began to change that. And, you know, one of the good things about uh, a lot of miles in ministry is you finally, eventually, hopefully, occasionally listen to the Spirit of God. And uh, so I knew that he was changing that. And, uh, and so today, the message that I want to bring to you is the message that the Lord has strongly put on uh, my heart. I don't know if you know anything about the, the Roman civilization, Roman uh, uh, history, uh, uh, but uh, there was a Roman uh, city, Pompeii. It was destroyed by a, a traumatic volcanic explosion in AD 79. Uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted and literally wiped out this uh, whole city and, and Herculeum too. It was not just Pompeii, um, but it buried the city and it happened so quickly, it buried the city in ashes. There were people who went up high to try to escape, and, and they were buried. There were people that tried to go below ground to shelter from the eruption. And they, this hot ash was so strong and so powerful, literally. It incinerated people. It, uh, it entombed and entrapped people. And, um, and so it was that horrific kind of, of volcano. But... Uh, um, as they did uh, in the years that followed, many years, uh, centuries later, as they uh, unearthed and ec uh, uh, excavated uh, Pompeii, they found something interesting. And there was a Roman sentinel soldier who had, by his authority, been posted at the gate of the city. And they found him, they unearthed him, uh, standing in his position with his weapon at his side, just like he was when the mountain erupted. He was on his post uh, a thousand years later. That's how they found him. He had been uh, petrified, so to speak, in place where he was in, in uh, all of the commotion and all of the turmoil. He never left his post. And the fact is that many of you today listening to me feel like you're uh, undergoing a uh, a volcano of some sort, uh, perhaps in uh, your life, that there's an eruption or you are under attack. And, and I don't know what that may be for you. And it may be physical illness. It might be some financial pressure. It could be emotional stress that you're going through right now. It could be any number of issues. And the devil is using those issues to, to keep you from standing in place, from keep, to keep you from standing in your, uh, the place that God has put you. He's using those things to beat you down and to, uh, to wear you out and to try and cripple you spiritually and most of all, to try to use them to undermine your faith and trust in God. Whatever it may be in your life, God wants you to stand firm. And I believe the message that God has given me this morning is for you and to help you stand firm. You may say, Pastor, well, I really, I, I can't identify with any of the things you, you just said. Well, you just hang on. You will. Uh, and uh, so this message is for you, too. 
uh, to not be shaken and to not abandon your post. You know, it looks like when, uh, when you look out in our world, everything is shaking, doesn't it? It looks literally like a, 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 a global earthquake is going on metaphorically and that it, all the foundations are being shaken. What is the believer to do in the midst of that? Because it creates all kinds of things, stress and discouragement and fear and all of those. How do we stand in the midst of that? And that's a bit of what I want to talk to you about uh, this morning. If you're physically able to do so, why don't you stand with me as we read our text? Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 10, I'm picking up in the middle of a story that I bet most of you know. It is the story of Israel's exodus out of Egypt. Verse 10, when Pharaoh drew near... The people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, it is, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have, we, what have you done to us to, uh, in bringing us out of Egypt? Is, it not this, uh, is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. By the way, that's a lie. They didn't say, leave us alone. We want to serve the Egyptians. For 400 years, they had been praying, God, get us out of here. But nonetheless, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you, will, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Now, Father, would you teach us again, uh, Father, the principles and the truths of your word from this story. Uh, Lord, we're so like the Israelites, Father. When all is well, we stand so easily. But when the foundations are shaking, Father, we begin to fear and tremble and we begin to take our eyes off of you. Would you teach us today, Father, how to stand firm? Would you use this story in your word, in your Holy Spirit, Father, to make it real in our hearts and Lord, we pray that you would bind up the enemy, that he cannot create any kind of discord or confusion in our minds, but that your Holy Spirit would have free access to all of us in these moments, and that you would speak very clearly, very loudly to us, and that you would transform and change us. But we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, again, most of you know this story, the story of the Exodus uh, of God's people out of Egypt after 400 years of bondage. And I said a moment ago, they had been crying out to God for all of those years for deliverance. Uh, they had never made the, the, uh, 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 or created the agenda or the idea that they didn't want to leave, that they, didn't, they wanted to stay and serve the Egyptians. No, that, just the opposite. They wanted out of there. God uh, and, and uses Moses to lead their deliverance out of the land of Egypt. And the Bible says that he did it with a mighty hand and great miracles and the promise of new life and a new land that was ahead for them. But here they are with their backs to the Red Sea and their Egyptian enemies pursuing them on the front side and they've already, this is a short time after their departure out of Egypt. This is a short time. I mean, they're still in, technically, in Egypt. And, and uh, yet, uh, suddenly, they have forgotten what God had done for them. They had forgotten the miracles. They had forgotten the mighty hand that God had, had used to deliver them from Pharaoh and their Egyptian captors. And here we find them having forgotten and suddenly overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. They were angry at Moses they called out and cried out to God. Their faith in the promises that God had given to them was shaken, and they were ready to cave in and return to their old life of bondage. They're ready to go back to the stuff that they had screamed and cried, God deliver us from. They were ready to go back to a faithless kind of existence. I think it's safe to say that all of us have been in that place before. Would you agree with that statement? where our faith has been rattled or rocked a little bit, and maybe even we thought about throwing in the towel, so to speak, spiritually. We've thought about, I just can't do this. This is too hard. It's too difficult to, to live for God or stand for God. And maybe some of you listening today by television or radio or live stream in this live audience, maybe that's what you're saying in your heart right now, that's exactly where I am. I, I'm struggling. I'm wobbling I'm ready to throw in the towel spiritually. You're living in fear. You are characterized by anxiety at what you are dealing with. And it may be very personal stuff that you're dealing with. And some of you may be wondering, is it even worth it to try and stand firm? I want to tell you this morning with a resounding answer, yes, stand firm. You know, if we could go back 
to this uh, setting. Let's just say we could be transported back to, to this moment where Israel is wobbling and complaining and thinking they want to go back to Egypt. If we could just go back to that moment, we would be brilliant counselors, wouldn't we? And we would say to them, we would, we would say to them, hey, Israel, stand firm. Listen to Moses. Listen to what God has said. Stand firm. And we would be able to say that. And what would make us brilliant counselors is the fact that we know how the story ends. So we could go back, but they didn't in the moment, did they? They didn't know how it was going to turn out. And, but we could go back and counsel them and say, just hold on. It's going to get better. Just hold on. Wait and see. <clears throat> we could do that. But the fact is, we're often just like they are. In the moment, we forget what God has done. We forget his promises to us. The pains of life are sometimes so overwhelming. We forget what God has brought us through. The fact that you're sitting here today means God's brought you through a whole lot. For you to be here, God has brought you through. And we're reminded of what the scripture says. God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And the fact is, if God has brought you here, he has brought you through a lot, and that means God's working, and God's not finished with you, and God wants you to stand firm because God is for you. <clears throat> if there's probably a, a simple truth that we often forget, it is that God really is for us. We sang about it already this morning in one of our songs, and, and that God is for us. If God can be for us, who can be against us, the Scripture says. So, Stand firm. Trust God to get you through whatever your Red Sea is. He didn't get you this far to abandon. He didn't bring you this far and say, okay, this is as far as I'm going. I'm leaving you. So don't you abandon him in that moment. So I want to encourage you uh, with four things about standing firm this morning from our passage. Number one is found in verse 10. It says they feared greatly. Stand firm, my friend, when you are distressed and afraid. Stand firm when you're distressed and afraid. Um, you, the Bible uses the word fear oh, about 500 times, and almost always it tells us not to be afraid, not to be afraid, fear not. Uh, but they were greatly afraid in this setting because they were living by their eyes. And, the, you know, the devil will use your eyes to intimidate you. I don't know if you know anything about Western history, but uh, back in the, uh, the Wild West, we would say, in the 1800s, there was a notorious professional thief that went by the name of Black Bart. I watched a documentary on Black Bart. And Black Bart uh, was, uh, nobody knew what he looked like because he wore a black uh, uh, bag, essentially, over his head. And and so uh, he brought terror to the stage lines of, of Wells Fargo uh, between 1875 and 1883. He robbed 29 different stage coaches uh, 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 during that period of time. And uh, he did it, listen to this, amazingly without ever firing a shot. He never had to fire a shot. It, the hood that he wear, wore was so intimidating and since nobody ever saw his face, by the way, nobody knew who to track. So the marshals of that era never tracked him. The sheriffs never tracked him. And what he did is he essentially used this, uh, this uh, intimidating presence to cause people to be paralyzed with fear. And then he would rob these stagecoaches. They never caught him. Uh, to our understanding, and, uh, and, and he was uh, incredibly uh, notorious, and then he just disappeared off the scene after years of Rob. I guess he was incredibly wealthy by that point in time. But I thought about that story, and I thought, you know, that's exactly what the enemy does. He uses his, his um, uh, demeanor to intimidate us. He uses the things around us to intimidate what we see. We, what we see causes us suddenly to live uh, in fear. And that's why the Bible tells us that we are to keep our eyes on God. It, we are to keep our eyes on Christ. It's why the Bible tells us that we do not walk by our sight, but we walk by faith. So when you are distressed and you're afraid, if you will, uh, if you will notice a lot of times it's because of what you're watching. I, I don't mean television, though that probably is true too. But I mean, what you're, what you're watching, what you're looking at, your eyes uh, can, 
can intimidate you. The devil will use what's going on around you to get your eyes off of God, in other words, and see the circumstances and the difficulties of your life. So what, what do you do when you're distressed and afraid? Well, let me suggest to you four things. Write these down. Number one, make sure you're trusting God with your situation. Make sure you're trusting God. with your. Don't just say, well, I trust God. Say, I trust God with this matter. I'm trusting God with this matter. Make sure you're trusting God with your situation. Psalm 56.3 says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So may I ask you this morning, are you trusting God with whatever that matter is that you are facing? Israel... Israel was now living by fear rather than by trusting the God who had just delivered them and had promised to do so again. He had already told them he was going to deliver them further than this. But now they're, they're, they're living by their fear rather than trusting in God who they had just watched bring them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Make sure you're trusting God with your situation. Number two, remember that God really is on your side. God really is on your side. Paul in Romans 8, that great passage there where he, he lists a whole uh, a list of uh, matters that, that are part of the pains of life. And then he says this, but what shall we say about these things? If God is for you, this is what we'll say. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can... Listen, what was Paul saying? He's saying God really is on your side. Sometimes you think, well, is God there? Yes, God's there. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book many years ago called The God Who Is There and Is Not Silent. Sometimes we think he's silent, but that doesn't mean that God isn't working. He's for you. God is for you. God is for you. God, listen, let's say this together. God is for me, all right? God is for me. You ready? God is for me. Let's say it again. God is for me. He really is for you. Now, that doesn't mean that you have carte blanche to live however you want to live because you can say, well, God's for me. He is for you. And by the way, because he's for you, he'll discipline you. All right? So be careful in your understanding. But God really is for you. He, why, why? Because God loves you. He loves you so much. Alice and I returned uh, last week. I, by the way, appreciate the message that Chuck uh, uh, brought last uh, Sunday. is excellent. We listened to it in the car. Well, we actually kind of watched it uh, in the car. We were driving back from uh, Nashville. My wife has it on, and I'm driving. And I tell you, it was a really good message. I only dozed off twice uh, in, in it. And, uh, but, but anyway, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, Chuck working and bringing such a powerful message. But uh, so we're, we're coming back from Nashville. We'd been up there with our, grand, our, our youngest one. It celebrated his two-year birthday. And the oldest one is four and a half, Bodie. And uh, they're both just so much fun. And Bodie will just spontaneously, out of nowhere, he'll ask Allison or he'll ask me, he'll go, he'll say, Pops, how much do you love me? And he'll do it just spontaneously. And he does it, you know, I, I mean, two or three times a day. He'll just say, Pops, how much do you love me? And I'll do this. Allison does it, of course, too. And I'll say, well, Bodie, I love you. I, I love you so much. I said, I can't even tell you how much I love you that much. And so I decided to try something. And he did that a couple times with me. Pops, do you, uh, how much do you love me? And so I, did, and, and so I, I tried. I reversed it on him. I said, Bodie, how much do you love Pops? And this is what he did. He said, Pops, I love you too much. <laughs> well, you know what he meant. He was wanting to say so much, but, but I love you too much. And I thought about that. You know, that's what Jesus said. I love you too much. You know what he did? I'm, I love you too much to let you perish. I, I love you too much to let you miss what I have for you. And you know what? God loves you so much that he stretched out his arms on the cross to show you. It's really true. He did this because of his love for you. So remember this as you, as you face whatever your Red Sea is. Remember this, that God really is on your side. He is not on the side of the enemy. And when you look out in your world today and you wonder what's going on, you remember God is still on the winning side 
God's side will be the winning side. We know what the book says. But when you look out there, you remember God is for me. He's not for the enemy of my soul. Number three, um, walk with the assurance that God is with you. When you are distressed and afraid, stand because you have the assurance that God is with you. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua was afraid a little bit. He was following Moses, and he had to lead the people into the promised land. And God says to him in various ways, three different times in the first chapter there of Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. And then he says, do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. That's distress. Don't be frightened. Don't be afraid. Don't be distressed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you're stressed, if you're afraid today. I just want to say to you, remember, you can walk with the assurance that God is with you. You're not walking alone. And number four, take your fears to the Lord. Take your fears to the Lord. Prayer still works, people. The psalmist said in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And listen to this, he delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Prayer is not a last resort for your stress and distress and your fears. Prayer is the first response. Take your fears to the Lord. Get on your knees. Use the altar. Take your fears before the Lord. So stand. Stand firm when you're distressed and afraid. The second time I want you to stand firm is when you are discouraged and forgetful. Stand firm. When you're discouraged, you're forgetful. You see, they were discouraged because they were looking at the enemies. They were living by their eyes, their sight, not by faith. They were, they were discouraged also because they forgot everything God had just done for them. You might be relieved to find out that you're not the only one who forgets things. According to researcher Karen Bola, everyone does at one time or another forget things. In fact, here are six things that their research has revealed that people most often forget, counting down. Number six, faces. 42% of people forget faces. Number five, 49% forget what was said. You know what that's like, right? You've had a conversation with someone, you walk off and you think, what were we just talking about? 53%, number four, forget words. Words. There's this word, and it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't get it out. You've been there, haven't you? 57%, number three, forget telephone numbers. Telephone numbers. Man, I can't remember telephone My wife, she is a whiz with that. I can't remember telephone numbers. 60%, number two, forget where something is. Forget where something is. I put it down. I don't know where it is. And, and some of you have even had to go through the trash <laughs> on several occasions because you think, I, I must have thrown that away, right? How many of you have ever had to do that? Yeah, okay. A bunch of you had, and the rest of you are not telling the truth. <laughs> you say, no, Pastor, it's not that I'm not telling the truth. I just forgot whether or not I've had to do that. Number one, can you, you, you know what number one is? Names. Forget names. You've had somebody tell you their name, and then you walk away and say, I don't remember their name, haven't you? Well, don't feel so bad about it, because they walked away and couldn't remember yours, <laughs> all right? And if you can't remember where you've just uh, done something, you join 38% of the population. Well, that's interesting, interesting figures, but I would add something to that list, especially for God's people. I would add for God's people that we tend to forget what God has done for us in the past. Would you agree with that one? We tend to forget what God has done for us in the past. And much discouragement is simply the result of not remembering what God has done to bring you through things in the past. Now, Israel was discouraged here because they had forgotten. Already they had forgotten what they had asked God for. What had they asked God for, class? Deliverance. And they had already forgotten that God had delivered them and that God had done uh, it with great power and might. They had forgotten what he'd done. They had forgotten how he'd done it. They had developed a kind of, I guess, what you might call spiritual amnesia. 
And so they were struggling to stand firm because they had forgotten. Do you have spiritual amnesia? You're going through something right now. You're to, your back's to a Red Sea of some sort. Have you developed spiritual amnesia? Have you forgotten what God has done for you in the past? So how do you respond to, to this kind of discouragement and, and spiritual forgetfulness? Well, there are two things. Number one, write this down, recall the promises of God. Re- recall the promises of God. If you go over to chapter 13, look at chapter 13. Look at verse 11. Listen what, what verse 11 says. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and shall, uh, uh, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all the first uh, uh, of, the, of the womb. Look, what is that verse telling us? It is telling us that God had told them, I'm going to bring you into the land of the Canaanites. Just as I swore to your fathers. Now, so, so their back is against the Red Sea. What are, what are they thinking, class? We're going to die. Uh, we're going to die here. But if they'd have just remembered the promise of God, they said, we're not going to die here. <laughs> we will die in the, in the promised land. But we're not going to die here. Because we have a promise from God. If they could have just remembered. And I I say to you uh, to remember what God has promised. you got a book full of promises, by the way, called the Bible. But recall the promises of God. And sometimes those promises are very personal, right? You have some. I have some very personal promises that God has given me. And I hang on to those. And some I've watched God uh, carry out, and some I'm still waiting for, but I hold to them. And by the way, when you get discouraged, you hang on to the words that God has given you, the promises that God has given you. And some of you watching or listening today, perhaps you've forgotten the promises that God has given you. Maybe God said something to you or whispered something to you consistent with his word some years ago or months ago, and you've just forgotten all about that, and you've allowed your eyes to take over instead of the, your faith in the word and the promises of God. Listen, when you're discouraged, go back to the promises of God. Recall the promises of God. Then number two, rejoice in the Lord. What was Israel doing? Israel was complaining when they should have been rejoicing in the promises that they had. They could have been rejoicing saying, doesn't matter what the enemy looks like. We know the promise we have. We'll rejoice in what we've been told. We'll rejoice in the promises of God. Paul, when he sat in a prison, he rejoiced. Did you know that? He sat there and he, re- I, uh, he, he said, I, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice, sitting in a prison. And then Habakkuk, the prophet, wrote these words in chapter 3. He said, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. If all of that's true, here's what he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. So listen, when you are discouraged, recall what are the promises God has given me. When you're discouraged, practice something. Practice rejoicing. God, though there be no fruit on the vines, there's no cattle in the stalls, uh, I I don't see how you're going to provide. I will rejoice. I will rejoice in you. I'll take joy in you because you are the God of my salvation. And so when you're discouraged, rejoice. Stand firm on the promises that God has given you. And rejoice regardless of the circumstances. Then third, stand firm in God when you are doubtful and uncertain. When you are doubtful and uncertain. Look at verse 12. Is not this what we said to you in Egypt, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Well, no. But now they're doubting everything that, uh, that God had done for them. Uh, Israel went from celebrating. Now you said, well, they weren't rejoicing. They were complaining. Yes, they were complaining. But when they came out, they were celebrating. When they first left Egypt, they were celebrating. A million plus people, they're all celebrating. And by the way, Pharaoh had said, take whatever plunder you want to take with you. 
take gold and resources and cattle and all this. And they were having a big time. They were rejoicing as they left. But by the time they get to the Red Sea and they see that, uh, that the enemy is approaching now, they went from rejoicing to, to uncertainty and doubt. They doubted Moses. They doubted his leadership. And in so doing, they cast uncertainty as to why they were even there. Why have you brought us out here? We don't, we don't understand. They, they, they began to doubt. And because they doubted, they assumed a nefarious agenda on the part of God. Why? They were living by sight again. They began to question God's plan. They began to question the circumstances they found themselves in. I want to ask you this morning, have you learned to see your circumstances from God's point of view? See, they weren't seeing their circumstances from God's point of view. They were seeing their circumstances from their point of view. This it doesn't look good. But may I ask, if you, start, if you start viewing your circumstances from your own point of view, it will lead to doubt and uncertainty in your life. Doubt uh, about the plans of God and the purposes of God. You, you, because, why? Because you're looking through your point of view. You don't realize that God has a different point of view of what's going on. And the devil will try and use your senses to make you question and doubt the ways of God. What is God really up to? God can't be... God, this doesn't make sense to my senses. It doesn't uh, look right to my eyes. Uh, 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 what is God up to? And it'll cause you, and the devil uses that to cause you to doubt God uh, and to produce this kind of uncertainty in your life. Doubting is just another term for a wobbling kind of faith. So, how do you deal with your doubt? Well, number one, recognize the limitations of your physical sight. Recognize the limitations of your physical sight. Their circumstances looked impossible to overcome. But God was up to something. You see, they were seeing things through their viewpoint, not God's viewpoint. You say, well, what was God's viewpoint? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Look over at verse 4 in this same chapter. God is telling Moses what's going on here, and he says in verse 4, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. You see, there's two different viewpoints here, right? There was the viewpoint that Israel had because they were living by their senses, but there was something bigger going on. And what God wants you to know is you can stand firm because God is working even when you don't see it. And so you don't trust, you don't trust what your senses always tell you when it comes to what's happening in your life and the circumstances around you. And this is what was going on. God purposely made the Egyptians chase them. And he made them chase them because God was about to do something for his own glory. Did you notice that? He was going to do something that was going to bring him glory and that was going to make a statement to the entire known world at that time. The greatest empire on the earth was the Egyptian empire. And God was about to make a statement. He was about to say, you've worshipped your pharaohs, you've worshipped your idols, but I'm fixing to show you who God is. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do for my glory. And you see, what what God wanted his people to do is put their eyes on him and not their senses on what's going on around them. I don't know what's going to happen. Listen, God doesn't always tell you what he's up to. He doesn't always tell you, he, but he wants you to say, I don't know what's going on, but I trust God. I trust God. This is going to be something else when God resolves this. Whatever that may be, it may be something small in your life, but he wants you to approach it the same way. He wants you to say, yeah, this doesn't work with my senses, but I trust God because I have a promise from God. I can cling to the promise of God. I can rejoice in the word that God has given uh, to us. And, and so, by the way, later God tells Moses, lead them forward. Just take them on forward. So the first thing we have to do is recognize the limitations of our physical senses, our physical sight. What looked impossible was not impossible at all, but God was up to something. God's always working. And if you are walking with him, he is working for you because he is for you. And that means that he's up to something that involves you. The second thing I would tell you to do when, when you're dealing with your doubts is, is to decide to believe. Decide to believe. 
Now, it's important to understand something. You can decide not to believe. God doesn't have to have us. God loves us. God wants us. God has provided a way for us. But his kingdom and his purposes will not be sidetracked if you decide that you're not going to believe, if you're not going to follow him. His kingdom purposes are not going to be thwarted. It is a choice that he wants you, he wants you to make. Years ago, a, a couple came to me for marriage counseling, and, and I talked with them, uh, as, I, as I do uh, all couples, about making sure they know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. I, I don't think there's any ultimate reali- uh, 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 reality to a healed marriage apart from Christ. He is the creator, and the best marriages are Christ marriages. And they came and they were wanting marriage counseling. And so I talked to them about Christ and neither of them knew Christ as their Savior. And he was a big guy and he sat across from me and he didn't want to be there. Have you ever seen somebody that was in a place and they didn't want to be there? It's like some of you here this morning. (laughs) And he was sitting there and it was pretty intimidating. He was a big guy and she was a petite little lady and we were talking uh, a bit about the Lord. And so I came to a place where I looked at her and I said, is there any reason you couldn't trust Christ as your Savior? And tears began to roll down her face, and she said, no, I need to do that. Can I do that? I said, I want to lead you in a prayer, and I led her in a prayer uh, to trust Christ uh, as her Savior. Then I looked at him, and I said, how about you? Is there any reason you couldn't trust Christ? And this is what he did. He, he, He was like this. He said, yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do that. I, I, I'll do that. I, maybe it'll make everybody shut up and get them off my back about trusting uh, Christ. Well, what would you have done? Well, I'll tell you, I'm not counseling you to do this, but I will tell you in that moment. I looked at him and I said, no, no. No, no, not here you won't. Not, not today. Not now you won't. Uh, I, and he, he was stunned when I said that to him. And I said, I don't think you understand this. This is not about doing something that makes the preacher feel good. This is about your eternal soul. And you don't, you don't, you don't get your soul right with God by doing something to get people off your back. This is personal. And I said, it's okay. You're not doing it. Not, not, not here today. And, and um, I Look, I'm not counseling you to say what I I said next, but I said, I I want you to understand something. I'm not trying to notch my belt with another soul for God. I said, the fact is, I'm saved, and when I die, I'm going to heaven, and your wife is now saved, and when she dies, she's going to heaven, but you don't understand something. It's no skin now off of my back if you die and go straight to hell. I think it was the Spirit of God in that moment. I've only done that one other time in my entire ministry. And I'm not counseling you to do that. I, you're saying, Pastor, that's pretty strong. It is pretty strong. And I just have to, it was a moment. It was a thing. He did this. He, he went pale. And he said, oh, no, no, no I'll, I'll do that. I said, no, you're not here. He, he said, I, I'll do it. I said, no, you need to think about whether you really are choosing to follow Christ or now you're doing it because I just scared you. Folks, <clears throat> We have to decide to believe. No one can believe for you. I heard a governor years ago of one of our southern states say this, I'm counting on a godly mother and father to get me into heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. The fact is we must decide. And you know what? They had to decide to believe or not. God doesn't have to have us. God wants us. He loves us. He died for us that we might know Him and be restored. But God wants us to decide. I have decided to follow Jesus. You know, I think about Joshua chapter 24, a familiar passage perhaps to many of us in verse 15, it, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. 
But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You, you remember the story of the demonized, uh, the, the man who brought his demonized son to Jesus? And he tells, he describes, he says, you know, it sometimes throws him into the fire or throws him into the water. And he describes all this demonic activity that his son is going through. Then he says to Jesus, I brought him to your disciples and they could not help him. And so now I bring him to you. And, and if you can, would you heal him? You remember Jesus' answer? Jesus looked at the man and said, if, if I can. And then he said, all things are possible to him that believes. You remember the man? I love the man's response because I've been that man. And the man looks back at Jesus and says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He said, Lord, I know. He said, my faith is small. You know, Jesus only needs a little bit. And he healed his son. He cast the demon out uh, of the son, what the disciples couldn't do. Friend, I want to tell you something. Jesus needs you to believe. Stand firm in faith and belief. That is a choice. So when you are doubting, choose to believe and order your life by that belief. But here's the final thing I want you to see this morning, and that is stand firm when you are debating and impatient. Anybody here ever get impatient? Verses 13 and 14, notice what, what the Scripture says. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. Israel was restless. They were stressed. They were anxious. They were contentious and impatient. They were wasting their energy debating what God and Moses were doing. Remember, they kept saying, hey, why did you bring us out here? Did you bring us out here? They're debating and discussing all of this sort of thing. And Moses finally says, listen, listen, the Lord's going to fight for you. Be silent. You're going to get to see the salvation, but you're going to have to stand firm uh, in uh, your faith. So God tells the people to do four things. What are they? Because it's good counsel for us. If you're here today, you're watching by live stream, television, radio. Listen, if you're wobbling in your faith, if you're having trouble standing firm, if you're looking at things going on in your life, or you feel like your back is up against the Red Sea, listen, here's four things for you. Number one, verse 13, fear not. You know what that is? Calm down. Calm down. Why? God is for you. What did he say? God will fight for you. You're restless, you're anxious, you're stressed. Calm down. Believe what God has said. Believe in God. And, and relax in Him. Fear not. God is for you. God is going to protect you. Number two, calm down. Number two, stand up. Stand firm. Verse 13, that's where he says it. Stand firm. Hold your place. That's the idea. It's, the idea is like a military uh, idea where a soldier takes his... You, you know that, that Roman centurion that I talked about at the beginning there at uh, uh, Pompeii who was in his position. He, was, he held his position no matter what the volcano did. He held his position there. And this is the idea here when he tells us to stand firm. It is stand firm because of your faith. You have made a decision. You have decided to trust God. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to stay in my place. That's what he tells us. So calm down. Stand up. Hold your place. Don't give ground to the enemy. And you don't have to give ground to the enemy. You don't have to live in fear of the enemy. Now listen, you, the healthy respect is important. He's a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. But you don't have to give up ground to him. Stand your ground. That, stand firm. God is on your side. And if God be for you, what class? Who can be against you? Stand up. Calm down. Stand up. Number three, uh, uh, number three look up. Verse 13, see the salvation. Keep your eyes on God. Watch what He does. If you do, listen class, you'll get to see miracles. If you will calm down, stand up, Look up, you'll see the power of God. 
You'll see, instead of living in panic, you'll get to see the power of God. You'll get to see miracles in your life. You'll have stories. I read about a man who said one time, he said, you know, I I got to the point in my my Christian life, I got tired of telling other people's success stories, how God had come through. And I started thinking, God, I want to have my own success stories. And and he said, what I had to learn was that I was going to have to trust God in my own circumstances. You want some miracle stories where God came through? I know you have some. But you want miracle stories? Calm down. Stand up. Look up. And then number four, my favorite, shut up. Look at verse 14. What did he tell them? (laughs) He said to be silent. You know what it meant? Quit murmuring. Quit complaining. Quit questioning. Quit second-guessing God. Enough complaining. Be quiet and listen to God. Frankly, dear friends, much impatience and debate about what God is doing in our lives is simply the result of not shutting up long enough and watching to see what God is going to do. Do you know the Bible, there's a theology about being quiet in order to see God move. In Psalm 62, verses 5 and 6 say, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Isn't that a great verse there? Listen again. O my soul, wait in silence. Be quiet. Calm down. Be quiet. For my hope is in Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, My fortress, I shall not be shaken. I'll stand up. In Psalm 46.10, the psalmist says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Do you know, folks, you say, well, it doesn't look like it right now. He's not finished. He will be exalted in the nations. That day is coming. That he will be exalted above all. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. Those who, who, who fall on their faces before God because he is their God. And those who fall on their faces because they didn't make him their God. One day, every knee will bow. He will be exalted. He'll be exalted in the universe. He'll be exalted among the nations. You say... I want to see that day. Well, keep looking up. Look up. Your redemption draws near. So no matter what you're facing, God's word for you, and I believe it is for some particularly today, is to stand firm. What is God saying? He's saying, I'm for you. I'm with you. I will fight for you. Stand firm. Even though your back is against the wall, even though there seems to be no place to go, stand firm, for I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make a path where there is no path. That's who He is. Keep your eyes on Him. If you're discouraged today, if you're stressed today, if you're afraid today, if you're doubting today, if you're uncertain today, listen, God's Word reminds us to stand firm. Believe Him. Trust what He said. And watch and see what He does. His great deliverance in your life. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Maybe that's you today. You, you feel like you're, that's where you are right now. And as I said earlier, if, if you're not there, you will be. It's called living in a broken world. Why don't you just tell God right now in your heart, God, I will stand. And you say, well, I'm not sure I will. Say, well, God, help me stand. God, I want to stand. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. This morning, help my unbelief. Some of you in this place... You need to start by deciding to follow Jesus. It is your choice. 
And you can call on him right now. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How do I do that? Call out to him, Lord Jesus, I believe. Not just with my head. I receive you into my life. I invite you to come in. Forgive me of my sins and be my Savior, my Lord and Master. He'll do it. He's promised. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what? I've been wobbling. I've just been wobbling. Today, I'm deciding to stand on the truth that God has delivered to me. The fact that God has brought me through in the past means that he's not finished with me now. I'm going to put my eyes, Lord, on you. Now, Father, would you hear these prayers that we offer up to you? I know you do. And Father, would you speak now in these moments before we're gone? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me for our invitation? I'll be here at the front, and there will be staff on the aisles, and I just invite you to slip out. If you need to trust Christ, or if you prayed that prayer to trust Christ, and balcony, ground floor, would you slip out and come and say, Pastor, I did that, uh, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay? Maybe you need a church home. You, you want to join Ridgecrest. You can use the tear-off panel for any of these decisions and take that to the welcome desk or drop it in the basket. We'll, we'll take care of that and follow up with that. But maybe, maybe today you want to come and say, I'd like to join this place. I'd like to be a member. Maybe you want to come and use the altar. Remember, prayer is not a, a last resort. It's a first response. Maybe you want to come and kneel before him. You're praying about uh, something, or maybe you're, you've got a Red Sea you're facing, and an enemy, and you, you just need to talk to him and humble yourself. Bow the knee. Hey, by the way, it's good practice because we're all going to do it eventually. And Well, you know, come and use the altar. Whatever God's moving in your heart and life to do right now, it's so important that you obey Him. Are you ready? As we're led in invitation music, you come. Slip out right now. Come on.